Hey, good morning, Grace Church family. Thank you for joining us at Grace Church Online. We are so happy that you are with us for Church at Home. And if you are new, we welcome you in Jesus' name. We are so happy that you have joined us today. Before I begin the message today, I, I do want to just take a moment to express uh, for our church family our love, appreciation, and gratitude to uh, a couple that moved away last weekend. They have been an integral part of our church family. They have demonstrated great love and grace impacting not only our church but our community. And uh, we just want Todd and Jamie Sutton to know that we love them. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't do a proper send-off for you, but our thoughts and our prayers go with you. And we pray that God will bless you in this new chapter in your life. Amen. <clears throat> As a church, um, I want to share something with you that I was struggling with uh, recently, uh, something that is challenging for me to talk about. I want to share it with you, and the main reason I do is because I know that some of you are struggling with it too. The other day, I was talking with Charmaine, my wife, on the phone. I think it was Monday, and I just was struggling. I was having a really bad day, and I just felt inside feeling suffocated, if you understand what I'm saying. It, what I was experiencing was overwhelming. Now, she knew that something was going on, but she wasn't exactly sure what, and I... I, I I have this tendency of going, I'm all right, it's no big deal, I'll get through it. And I think guys tend to do that a lot. But uh, I, the thing is, is I, I, I am in a season of mourning. And there are a number of reasons why, and I'll get into some that I'll share with you in a moment. But one of the main reasons is that we just uh, recognized my mom's passing from one year ago. And one of the things that happened is I was so busy running back and forth with my family, trying to get stuff together, making sure everything was okay, I really didn't have time to grieve. And as this year came up on April 28th, which was also my wife's birthday, my mom also passed away, I didn't want to take away from her birthday, but I, inwardly I was celebrating her, but inwardly I was grieving the loss of my mom. And uh, I was sad, I was hurting, and I was broken, and I just felt overwhelmed. And I'm, I'm still in a season of mourning. And the thing is, like I said, I know I'm not alone. That there are many people in our world today who are in mourning. Here's a few examples. If, if you were listening a, a week or two ago when the Arbery tapes were released where he was shot and killed, uh, you would have heard a collective groan from many people who were wounded, who mourned the senseless loss of a life. Uh, I read a story the other day about a man who was a, 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 a black man who was doing a delivery in a gated community. He was driving a delivery truck, and he was blocked because the, the head of the homeowners association was trying to demand, why are you here, why are you here? And he says, I literally cried for hours after that was over with because he felt stripped of, of dignity, of worth. Uh, people are in pain, they have fear, uh, and they are experiencing because of things that are happening in our life. Not only with just the taking of life, but the loss of life, like my mom, I have a, a friend here today uh, in the service who's helping with the sound, who had an uncle that passed away a short time ago from COVID-19, and not much more than two weeks later, his aunt passed away as well. There are people who continue to grieve for uh, their child who has passed away. People are mourning because their dreams have died. Marriages have been placed under great stress, and what was already there has fractured. And we're going to see people mourning marriages that are going to be ending because of what has happened. Special moments that have been lost because of what's going on. People invested their blood, sweat, and tears in their business. They invested their life, and it has been closed down permanently. Since mid-March, we've had more than 40 million people apply for unemployment. There have been, thankfully, more than 1.9 million uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 where people have recovered. But there are still over 88,000 deaths in the U.S. and over 308,000 deaths globally from this pandemic. Mourning... Uh, is going to happen because with the stay at home there has been an increase in abuses and we probably won't hear about it for some time. There's been a, an increase in addictions because of the shutdown. But this is coming and many lives have been impacted by what's going on. And 
not only with the health and the economic, but there is a huge humanitarian crisis that's going on where people are out of work, they are hungry. Uh, people have now, because of what's happening economically, have been pushed back down into poverty. World Vision, a Christian ministry organization, says that there are 50 million children in the world right now who are in danger of starvation. Morning. David records a time where he mourned. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. David says this. It says, David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. Saul was the first king of Israel, and John, Jonathan was his heir apparent. They were killed in battle. And so David took up a lament about their deaths, and Jonathan was his tightest, closest, best friend. He grieved for what happened, and so he lamented. And he ordered that the men of Judah be taught this lament of the bow, which is written in the book of Jashar. So David took up a lament. He expressed in words what the nation was feeling, what they were experiencing. They had lost their first king. They had lost the heir to the king. And there is a palpable sense of national loss. The things that I can think of that most closely relate to it for us would be like when JFK was assassinated. And if you weren't alive then, go back and watch some of the documentaries about it and see the palpable loss that our nation experienced. Or, or look at 9-11 and what happened then where we mourned as a nation, as a people, the deaths of those that were lost. So David takes up a lament. It actually really says, lamenting David lamented. And I want us to key on in that word today, lament, because it is a biblical word that speaks to the human experience. What is a lament? It is a dirge. It is a funeral song that was usually chanted. Mark Vrogop in Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy says this, Lament is the language of loss we grieve together. Lament is the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. To lament is to mourn. It is to grieve. It is to sorrow. It is to express the anxieties, the fears, the doubts, and the loss that you experience. And throughout the Bible, we see many examples of laments. In fact, there's one book that's dedicated to a lament. It's called Lamentations. And it is a common and it is an understood human experience. Being a person of faith does not exempt you from it. Now, I'm not trying to be a negative ninny. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. But, but I am trying to help us understand and acknowledge this simple but important truth. Bad things happen. When they do, we mourn, we grieve, we lament what is happening. Jacob was told that his son Joseph was killed, and he grieved for many years under the impression that his son, was his favored son, was dead and gone. The psalmist on several occasions, he looks out and he sees stuff happening, and he's mourning, he's lamenting what he's seeing, and he's saying, he's crying out to God, and he says, how long, O Lord, how long? How much longer before you do something about this situation, this circumstance? We see in the scripture that God grieved over his creation because they had fallen into such depths of wickedness. The prophet Jeremiah mourned the loss of King Josiah and lamented him. Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, his dear friend, and he grieved over his death, but he also grieved over the unbelief of the crowd. And I want you to hear this lament that Jesus makes over his people. He says in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He is lamenting. He is grieved. He is mourning that they were being stubborn, that they would not respond to God and the time of God's visitation to them. And it caused him great heartache and sorrow. Paul tells us that the Spirit of God grieves within us. In Romans 8.26, he says, In the same way, 
The Spirit helps us in our weakness. What does he mean by weakness? It's a number of things, but one of those is when we're dealing with sorrow, with grief, when we are mourning, when we are lamenting. The Spirit of God helps us in those times. Listen to what it says. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself, God himself in us, intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He mourns, he laments, he groans in us. And this is perhaps one of the greatest truths about laments, about mourning, that we do not mourn alone. God mourns with us. In our heartache, in our sorrow, in our times of loss, he is not only present, he mourns. I want to remind you, Jesus is God with us. He did not run away from the troubles. He did not run away from the difficulties. He didn't run away from the hard places in life. He ran to them. He embraced them fully and experienced things himself. And because of that, we have now. He understands what it is, what we experience, and what we go through. And now he is our high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, He's experienced what we've experienced, and now we can go to him, someone who understands, someone who knows, someone who gets it, and he is able to give us grace, mercy, and help in our time of need. I want you to know this because it is absolutely true. You are never alone when you mourn. You are never alone when you mourn. I know we often feel alone. We carry our thoughts, we carry our feelings, we carry our experiences, experiences, our emotions, the, the, the loss, we carry that with us. And one of the things that can happen is we don't want to talk about it because we know if we do, we'll start to, to break down and we don't want to break down in front of anybody. Or we, we just don't think that people will understand. And what happens when we don't open up and we don't talk about it, when we don't find someone to share with, what happens is we start to feel isolated and alone. But I want to remind you again, you are never alone. You are never alone when you mourn. I know we often feel alone, as I said, but understand this, when you weep, God weeps with you. And God not only weeps with you, but others do as well. And I I know I have found that people have often struggled in times of grief, sorrow, and loss, they have struggled how to communicate best love and concern. They, they struggle what to do. They're not sure what to say. They're not really sure what to say. It's just a difficult situation. And, and so we, we sometimes struggle. But Paul says this in Romans 12, 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And here's what he's saying. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the right words. But you do need to be present And if there is someone who is grieving, who is mourning, who has suffered loss, to be present with them and let their sorrows become your sorrows. Mourn with those who mourns. This is the example of Jesus, our Savior. This is the example he gave to us. So understand, we are never alone in our mourning, though I know sometimes we feel that way. We have one another. We have Jesus. And we also have his promises. Jesus is the one who said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now I want to ask you something. How many times have you heard that said at perhaps a funeral? I'll just be honest with you. If you're gathering with a group of people, they are hurting, they are broken, they are at loss, they are grieving. And to make a statement like that, man, it's either a well-meaning but a ridiculous statement It's a a pious platitude that that actually doesn't accomplish anything good. Or it's true. When Jesus said he will comfort those who mourn, he actually meant it. And now here's what I want you to hear today. This is what I want you to get. Jesus promises to comfort us when we mourn. Listen, Jesus promises to comfort you when you mourn. You are not alone. And when you have Jesus, your grief doesn't end in hopelessness because he promises to comfort us when we mourn. Does it still hurt? Yeah. Is it painful? Yes, absolutely. Does it ever end? Many people have asked that question when they're experiencing grief, they're mourning and lamenting. 
Does it ever end? It's a good question. And if you're asking that question, you're not alone. I'll be honest with you. When I was a lot younger, I used to think, well, God will heal all the hurts, you know. He'll take away all of our boo-boos, all the things that cause us pain. But as I've gotten older, I believe God can heal us, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But as I've gotten older, I believe there are some wounds that we experience in this life that are great, they, that are deep within us, that abide and remain. I understand that Paul said we don't grieve as those who have no hope. But understand what Paul is saying. We do grieve. We just don't grieve as if we have no hope. And when our hearts are faint, when our spirits are weary, what we need to do is to cling tightly to Jesus and to the promises that he gives to us. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. We need to cling tightly to him. You know, one of the reasons I I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I try not to bring it up too much. My wife told me not to talk about it so much, but it, it just speaks to us. It communicates profound truth in a fiction. You know the story how Frodo is on a journey. Everything's great and then everything just falls apart. Things are horrible. Things are bad. And and he is stabbed by a blade of the enemy in his shoulder. And slowly but surely that wound begins to ebb away his life. He eventually recovers and he has this scar from where he was stabbed. But though the, the wound had healed... There was a scar there that never left him. And he could be seen at times favoring it. And at times because of what he experienced and all that he went through in life, he would be found sometimes in fits. But he held this little white jewel that had been given to him. You don't see it in the movie. Talk about it in the movie, but it's in the books. And I was reading the books and I'm reading about him holding tightly during these times when he is overwhelmed with grief and sorrow and loss I can't say what J.R.R. Tolkien meant to communicate in that story, but when I read it, I think of how it's an example of how we need to cling tightly to the promises of God. When we're hurting, when we're overwhelmed, cling tightly to Him and cling tightly to His promises. There are scars that we experience, and the scars are wounds that have healed over. But I do believe this is true that not all wounds that we experience are fully healed in this life. We need to cling tightly to the one who is the fulfillment of all that God has promised. We need to cling tightly to the one who said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he had been sharing with them as they were heading to Jerusalem that he was going to die and they were grieving at what Jesus was saying they couldn't believe it all the dreams the hopes the things that they expected to happen all of that according to Jesus was not going to happen and he was going to die and that was going to be the end of everything Jesus knows that they're grieving and here's what he says to them I tell you the truth you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn to joy Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Now Jesus here is talking about the fact that he was going to, his death and his resurrection, that he, his death is going to cause them to weep, to mourn, to grieve. But thankfully the story doesn't end there because Jesus said, I'm going to see you again. I'm going to see you again. And when you see me again, the grief that you are experiencing is going to be overturned by great joy that no one can ever take away. And what I want you to see here in this passage is that Jesus makes a specific promise to the disciples. And I think to us. He says, your mourning will turn to mourning. I'll explain that in a moment. Your mourning, your sadness, your sorrow will turn to mourning, to a new day. You see, on Friday, Jesus' broken, bloodied, and lifeless body was laid into a borrowed tomb. To the disciples, all seemed lost. The world was dark. It was a time of lament. It was a time of grief. It was a time of sorrow and loss. But early Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. 
And what that means is this. The end of all mourning is found in the resurrection of Jesus. The end of all mourning, all of our hurts, all of our wounds, all of our pains, all of our sorrows, those things which grieve us and cause us to lament, the resurrection is the end of our mourning. Now let me ask you a question. Don't you love early morning, getting up, going outside, the sun's coming up, the, the world has come through the dark of night and now it's beginning to fill with color. The, the birds are singing, the, the air, the sky is blue, the grass is green, and it's just a beautiful picture. It's the start of a new day and a new day that is filled with promise. One day, we haven't seen Jesus yet, but one day we will see him. Our faith will become sight. And when that happens, he will turn our mourning into mourning. There will be an end to our mourning, and there will be the dawn of a new day, a new morning that never ends. And understand, it's not just the dawn of a new day, it's the dawn of a new era. Right now, there is times where we experience laments, griefs, sorrows, loss. We mourn. But the promise of Scripture, the promise of the resurrection is that it will not last forever. There is an end to it because Jesus is alive and he rose from the grave. And when we finally see him face to face, when we finally see him face to face, when our faith becomes sight, when we see him then, joy is going to overturn the grief and the sorrow that we have shared and experienced, and it's going to be replaced with an overwhelming and great joy that no one can ever take away. How our hearts long for that day when Jesus will turn our mourning into mourning. Maybe that's why John at the end of the book of Revelation says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because his heart longed for the day when mourning would give way to a new morning. I don't know if you're hurting, if you're broken today as you're watching, but I want you to know I'm praying for you today. You hurt, you're broken, you're lamenting, you're in sorrow, you're in grief. But remember, you you don't mourn alone. You have people that will mourn with you if you'll open up, if you'll talk, if you'll share. You have a Savior who grieves with you. You don't weep alone. You don't mourn alone. And we have the promises of God that we can cling to that one day those who mourn, we're going to be comforted not just now, but one day, one day that mourning is going to be gone and it will be a new morning, a new dawn of a new era. Jesus will turn our mourning into mourning. When we take communion, one of the things that we do is obviously we celebrate, we remember, I should say, the Lord's death. That his body was broken, that his blood was shed so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And today as we take communion, we gather together as the body of Christ to remember what he did for us how his body was broken and his blood was shed. So would you take and eat the bread in remembrance of his broken body? Would you take and drink the cup of his blood that was shed for forgiveness of sins? And Paul said that as often as we do this, We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in that day when he comes back to earth, we see him face to face. He will turn our mourning into mourning. Can I pray for you? If you're hurting, if you're broken today, if you're struggling, if your heart is grieving a loss, as I pray, would you just reach out to God today? Would you call out to him? and ask him to give you strength, to give you help, to to give healing into your heart and life, to comfort you in your mourning. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We live in a world that is 
an amazing world. There's so much beauty in it. But Father, if we're honest, because of what we've experienced, we know this is true. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of loss and mourning. And we come to you today because sometimes that's just overwhelming beyond what we can bear. But thank you that we don't grieve alone. Thank you that as we weep, you weep with us, that you are present in our sorrow. And thank you for the promise that you have given us that those who mourn will be comforted. And so I ask and pray today for those who are mourning, who are hurting, who are broken. God, today, would you just be near them? Would you minister to them? Would you minister your comfort to them as only you can do. Let them know that you are there, that you are present, and that you love them, and that this will not last forever. Because, Jesus, you're coming back, and when you do, you're going to turn our mourning into mourning. And how our hearts long for that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.